Welcome back. Now, my next guest needs no introduction, but he shall get one. He is among the most principled and courageous writers and thinkers in the world today with a moral clarity and command of language that is unmatched, as this Al Jazeera journalist found out last week. It, who, it is hang, hang on, internationally recognised. No, 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 it's not, it's, no, no, it's not at all. I want to move that's on. That's your view. Hang on, that's your view, and okay, I have to okay, correct our your view. view. Our views I, I differ. Have to correct. No, it doesn't. The facts... <laughs> Our views might differ, but the facts are the facts. And I want to pick you up on something you just did. I'm you interviewing you. I know, but I, yes. don't, I think you're uninformed. No, no, no. So no, let me just... So let me, you are uninformed. <laughs> oh, because really? first of all, yes. you didn't say that Egypt is blockading Gaza. Secondly, you claim that I'm, Israel... I'm, I'm talking on, about so Israel here, yeah, and, and I want oh, to well, move It's I very want to convenient for this. you to mention Israel, because oh. you've clearly got an animus here. Every time there would be a peace agreement, settlements would pop up, and that's why we are where we are today. No, it's not. So let's no, try and move on. No, it's not on. at all. No, let's try it's and move not at all where we are. Hang on. We're not achieving anything here, so let's try and move on. No, no, no. Let's try and move on. No, it's very... No, because you just did it again. You just threw in another false fact. We are not where we are today because of settlements in the West Bank that are disputed. That's not why Hamas broke out of Gaza on the 7th of October and massacred people in their homes. As that's we know, not, is that's the Hamas not because of the West Bank, support and you well know it. Yasser, you Yasser well Yasser know Arafat. that. Douglas Murray, so good to have you back in the studio. <laughs> Did you not take pity on that woman? I've got to say, she was smug, certainly uninformed, but, wow, the way you humbled her, it was... Um, well, even, even I felt a little bit sorry for her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you, you tend to go into an interview uh, like that. It was in South Africa, in uh, uh, Johannesburg. You tend to go in sort of, you know, with goodwill, assuming that the interviewer is hoping to get something interesting out of you and that, you know, you, they, they do so. And occasionally you go in and you discover, ah, this person is here to slay a dragon. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, the whole thing changes. Uh, I did discover afterwards something I wish I'd known before, which was when she said that she had lived in the region. I remember thinking there's something strange about that. <laughs> and then, of course, it turned out she'd worked for Al Jazeera, which means she'd lived in Doha. Oh. And even on a very clear day from Doha, you can't see Gaza. But, but uh, it was a Palin-esque uh, mm. uh, claim by her. Yeah, in the region. Yeah, that's all. The region. Is, uh, <laughs> red flags go off. Now, you have arrived in this country and been met with protests. We're normally a welcoming lot, but you've had the usual far left suspects very much agitated. They've labelled you uh, right wing, a racist, a supporter of genocide. Let's have a look at some of the chants we're seeing uh, uh, accusing you of supporting mm. genocide. Gosh. Douglas Murray, you can't hide, you're supporting genocide. Douglas Murray, you can't hide, you're supporting genocide. What is your response to that very learned criticism? Uh, uh, first of all, I, I don't feel like I'm hiding, Rita. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it's amazing. This, this only happened in Sydney, by the way. Uh, I did two shows at the Enmore Theatre uh, on Sunday. And uh, these protesters showed up, a small group of malcontents showed up on the afternoon. I I'm not sure why they didn't do the evening uh, shift. Uh, it's possible they didn't know about it. It's possible they slept in or... Uh, uh, actually, some of them moved on to the port in Sydney where they promptly got arrested. So oh, it was a great right. day for them. Uh, <laughs> well, some, but somebody actually... Well, it was very, very funny. One of them actually sort of tweeted something like, uh, a very important day standing outside the Enmore shouting at Douglas Murray. I was like... That's not a very good day. No. I mean, I think that's a kind of a waste of a day, not least because I could not hear them. Uh, it made no difference to me. Uh, thousands of, of uh, very, very nice, clever, informed, uh, good Sydney uh, uh, residents uh, all paid to come and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and join me for the day in two shows. And uh, they weren't intimidated by these people either. I mean, um, it's really pathetic. And I never, I never want that to sort of overshadow anything else. You know, I've spoken this past week in Perth, in Adelaide, in Brisbane, and we've had wonderful audiences. And it's, it's, uh, it was the same on, on Sunday. You know, you always get a few of these people who just scream and shout and think they're going to change the world. But they, they don't. They don't change my mind. They don't change the audience's mind. In fact, they just annoy audience members. Uh, and, of course, I mean, this thing about genocide, I mean, it's such a smear and a libel. I mean, mm. there is no genocide in Gaza. 
um, I support the efforts of the IDF to get the hostages back. And uh, if these people, by the way, if they, if they um, I mean, they're such geniuses, so they, they, they know how to spend their weekends in Sydney hollering. Uh, um, if they're such geniuses, uh, they should really come up with an alternative plan for the IDF to get back the children and women and men who are still in Hamas captivity and do so with a smaller body count than the one the IDF is currently um, uh, seeing, and uh, I, I bet these people don't have that. They think they have all the answers, but they don't. Well, this is what I don't understand. Just for the optics of it, if nothing else, you would mm -hmm. think these anti-Israeli protesters, or pro-Palestinian as they call themselves, would carry just a couple of signs that are anti-Hamas. Right. Calling on Hamas to release mm. the hostages, calling on Hamas to surrender, calling on right. Hamas to stop using the Palestinian people as human shields. Right. But you don't see that. And in no. fact, in the UK, when I think it was an Iranian man showed yes. up to a protest holding up an anti mass yes. sign, he was physically attacked by yes. the other protesters. Week after week. Uh, is a very brave young Iranian man, and he has simply gone to several pro of the protests in London holding up a, sa a sign saying Hamas are terrorists, which they are. And that's the British government's policy. Hamas are a prescribed terrorist organization in the UK. Yeah. So this brave young Iranian man holding up a sign that says British government policy, he is the one that has repeatedly been attacked by the peaceful protesters at the oh-so-peaceful marches, <laughs> and it has been the police that have moved him on. Mm. Uh, uh, I think he's an absolute hero. I love seeing uh, brave people like that standing up. It gives enormous hope to people, and, uh, and, and I hope more people do it. And I think it just shows the lies that we've been told about a lot of these protests, because the fact that he can't peacefully stand there and, in fact, be supported by those mm -hmm. people speaks volumes. That's right. Now, your tour, yes, in, in Sydney, you've had some uh, troublemakers. I'm sure in Melbourne you will, because it's the... Uh, it's the home of troublemakers. But it sold out your tour so quickly. I'm interested to know what the Australian people who are paying to hear you speak, what are they interested in, in, in talking about? What's top mm -hmm. of mind for them? I think it's several things. I mean, obviously, you know, people are very interested about the wider world, about the, the, the region, about wars I've covered recently, including the Hamas war, the Ukraine war. Um, but but in my, my, as far as I've seen it, we, we use a, a thing every night called Slido, so people can send in questions and then upvote the questions they really want you to answer, oh, which system. is a great system. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I've noticed that, I mean, there are very, very similar to concerns to other countries I've been to recently, and also um, specific ones to do with Australia. I mean, of course, you had the referendum last mm -hmm. year, and, and the referendum and, and issues related to it seem to be a sort of bubbling under the surface thing in this country, it seems to me, because there is this, and I've said this a couple of times to audiences here, that um, the vision of Australians that I grew up with and you grew up with has changed slightly yeah. in our own lifetime. In fact, you might say changed quite a lot. <laughs> um, and I see that kind of happy country, um, you know, frank speaking, clear thinking sort of Australian tradition sort of being subdued, mm. like it's chased out of people, like people are made to feel guilty for things they haven't done. Oh, yes. They're made to feel like they're usurpers and colonizers and all this sort of thing. And it's so destructive and you can see it, you can feel it, you can hear it. Mm. Um, you know, everybody wants to get along, everyone wants to do well in the future, but you know, there's no way that this country or any other country can if you're mired in the guilt and, uh, and this sort of, this sort of dampening down of the majority, you know, the sort of you can't say that, you can't think that. That's why I, I love referendums, actually. I mean, they're always an opportunity for the general public uh, to kick our political class in the ghoulies. You know? and, and like Brexit, when it came to this referendum, the race-based referendum, it was a case where you had uh, the entire elite, really, the, the, the celebrities, the activists, mm. the corporates, all mm. of them, sporting clubs, all on the side of the mm. yes vote, uh, which the, obviously the Australian government w was backing. And then the no vote wins in every single state. Yes. And that tells you plenty, even in left-leaning states like here in Victoria. But I think Vic we do have this unique problem in Australia, and I think it's particularly bad here, more so than the US and, and the UK, mm where there is this self-loathing. We, we mm. can't even celebrate our National Day, Australia right. Day, right. without being accused of uh, supporting genocide and white supremacy and it's an invasion and it's a harmful day. Uh, you madness. don't even have that in the UK or the US where... Y y y 
UK, they still revere their traditions. Mm -hmm. The US, there's a great deal of patriotism yes. across much of the country. But I just wonder what the impact is on a country that, that seems determined to hate itself. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the long-term impact, we don't yet know. I mean, we can guess. We don't yet know because, as far as I know, no civilization has tried this before. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, uh, most people sort of want to exist, want to thrive, you know, and, and most people are, are proud of what has gone well in their country. You know, every country's had things that, 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 that they're not proud of. Of course. Um, but... but it, the question isn't that, and isn't lingering all the time on that. The question is, what have we done well? You know, you saw this in Don Lemon's interview with Elon Musk last week, mm. where Elon Musk just said, you know, if we keep talking about the slave trade in America, we're never going to get past it. And uh, Don Lemon seems sort of thrown by that, uh, as he is by any original <laughs> thought. Um, but but, but he, he seemed genuinely thrown by that. But it's absolutely true. Mm. The question isn't whether or not you've 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 acknowledged any mistakes in your past. The, po the point is, are we able to get past them? Mm. And are we able to say anything good about ourselves? And if in Australia, the whole narrative is just, as you say, genocide yesterday, genocide today, genocide tomorrow, of course people aren't going to be brought up to be proud of their country. And of course they aren't going to see the good things. I would just beg the people who fall into that narrative, which includes a lot of young people who go along with the herd. Mm -hmm. A lot of young people don't, but a lot of young people do go along with that herd. I would beg them just to go somewhere else in the world, just for a week, yeah. and see yeah. the comparative rights that you have in any other country in this region and the rights you have here, mm -hmm. the traditions in any other region, the traditions you have here, what's gone well in other parts of the region and what's gone well here. And, you know, to, re uh, to, to revive uh, uh, um, something I've said to you before in other contexts, there's a reason that the boats come to Australia and they do not leave from Australia to other places. There is a reason. And if, and if the people who do this, there's nothing good about Australia, we're all genocidists and murderers and so on, which is absolutely preposterous. And nobody's guilty of things they didn't do. Mm. Um, but if those people could just reflect for a moment, you know, why is it? that if this country is as bad as these people and the, the, the corporations and all these pop stars and so on, if it's as bad as they say, why are people not fleeing Melbourne today? Why is this city booming? Why are people not fleeing he here for the sanctuary of communist China? Mm. There must be something we've done well. There must be something you've done well in Australia. I think there's a lot you've done well. The only place Victorians are fleeing is Queensland, to be <laughs> much further than Dan. But this notion of we're on stolen land, that seems to be... Preposterous. ..a grievance and, and, you know, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. You've flown around the country. I'm no, sure you've heard uh, as soon as a plane lands, this uh, acknowledgement of country. Yes. There's almost this notion that we are on interlopers on someone yes. else's land and we're not as entitled to feel that it's, it's as much ours as it yes, is. Yes, which means, which means you have a population where the majority feels less than. Mm. Now, I mean, that if you had a minority population, say 3% of the population, that was repeatedly made to feel less than the rest, I think we would say, look, that, that, that's ridiculous. That 3% of the population should be encouraged, should be made to feel welcome, should be made to feel at home. We don't hold them back, anything else. It would be madness to hold back 3% of your population. When you're dealing with the majority of your population being made to feel less than, I mean, as I say, that's an experiment no one has really tried before. No. People have tried to oppress minorities, but trying to oppress and beleaguer and demoralise the majority, the majority in a country, I mean, that's lunacy. It is, and that's what really the referendum was about. Yeah. It wasn't about equal rights. It was about giving a particular minority additional rights. Yeah. And that's where people said no. Yeah, we're either equal or we're not. That's it. You know? Absolutely. Now, you've been warning us about some of these issues for years now in, in your books, what's happening in the West, the threats against Western civilization. Um, what do you see right now in 2024 as the biggest threat facing the West? I think it's that one. I think it's within, Rita. Mm. I really do. I think it's the threat within of us delegitimizing ourselves. It's the threat uh, in America of people being, you know, um, 
I, I've said this a bit to audiences this week. If you look at the polls that came out when Ukraine was invaded in America, asking Americans whether or not they would fight for their country if it was invaded, only just a majority of Americans said they would. A minority of Democrats, a slight majority of Republicans. And it was the same recent in the UK when the defense minister said, look, if Russia does roll into the Baltics, we might have to have conscription. A minority of young Brits said they would be willing to fight for their country. But here's the thing. I understand that. I abhor it. I, I, I'm very, very sorry that it's the case. But I understand it because if you've been told your country was rotten from the start, as with Australia, entirely based on theft and colonialism and, and uh, repression and mm. racism and much more as if the rest of the world was based on just kumbaya. Uh, if, if, if you believe that, why, why the hell would you lay down your life for it? Mm. If, if you were told from kindergarten onwards that you were on stolen land, that you were a usurper, that you'd enslave people when you'd done nothing other than, you know, try to build a, some bricks or something. You know, um, why would you risk your life or lay down your life for a country you were told was rotten? And the answer is, it would be madness to do so. We are telling ourselves a totally false version of our history and at the very least an unfair version of our history. And it's the same in Australia, it's the same in Britain, same in America. And, you know, there's a very odd uh, thing that happens when that, when, when that occurs, which is that every opportunistic thing comes in. Mm. You know, people come in uh, and they claim you've done things that you've never heard of, and you say, well, probably that as well, because I'm guilty of everything else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, um, and, and before you know it, you're just accepting versions of yourself that are not just false, but are destructive. And I think that's the biggest one. But the good news is, that's one we can solve. That's one we can solve. How do we solve it? Is it uh, through the education system, the curriculum? How do we actually address this uh, teaching that we've had really now for decades mm -hmm. that we are inherently oppressors and evil and the success of the West is built on colonisation and yeah. the backs of oppressed people. Well, I mean, the first thing is no change like this can be done by government edict. Mm. You know, we can't wait for the Minister of Culture to announce a, a new uh, inquiry followed by a consultative process and then an interim report. Mm. That is not going to solve any of this. I believe it's in all of our hands. It's in the hands of everybody who voted in the referendum and the ones who didn't. It's in the ones, it's in the hands of everybody who wishes to have a better life here in Australia, here in the West. It's in our hands to say no when this narrative is pushed on us in whatever way you can. I've spoken this week to people from a bewildering variety of professions who've come to my events and you know, they very often have a story from the workplace of, you know, this was being said, I didn't know what to do, or I mm. did know what to do, and I did say something. I would say if everybody just took one step forward, that would solve an enormous amount of things. Just one step forward to say no, not to be pushed around. You know, I never saw Australians as a people, any more than, than I did my fellow Brits, I never saw us as people who could be easily pushed around. Actually, quite the opposite. We, oh. were, we were not easily pushed around, and we shouldn't be. But we are now, and we saw that during the COVID era here mm. in Australia in particular, but the yeah. UK was just as bad. I know Australia gets uh, a lot of coverage, particularly Melbourne for those six lockdowns, mm. but people were willing to submit to the most illogical, draconian measures mm. in the name of perceived safety, even when right. you, really, you didn't need to have a medical degree to realise wearing a mask outdoors by myself, this, where is the science behind that? But people right. just blindly followed it and attack those who, who challenged some of these edicts. Yeah, well, you know, there, there are several ways you can go after that. One is to decide, OK, everything in the rest of our lives should be, you know, um, treated in that sort of way, we should be super cautious people mm. and that the lesson of COVID is to be even more cautious and triple mask whenever you go for a run on the beach, obviously. obviously. Um, uh, but the other way is to say, actually, to learn a different lesson from that and say, you know, maybe we shouldn't be so easily pushed around. Uh, maybe, you know, the fact we were then, maybe it means we shouldn't be in the future. Mm. And maybe we should find some of our uh, courage again. And that, that's what I think. I don't believe people want to live as sort of subjugated, scolded people. Um, and if you want to get anywhere in your life as an individual or as a society, 
you've got to encourage not this uh, um, endless repression and this endless scolding. You've got to encourage heroism. Mm. You've got to encourage uh, entrepreneurialism. You've got to encourage daring. Mm. You know, uh, uh, the remarkable people that this country has produced were remarkable not because they were quiescent and and shy and didn't want to make a, a, any noise in the world. They were remarkable because they wanted to get out there. Yes. That's absolutely. what made this country. That's what made Britain. That's what made America. And that's what will make us tomorrow. And uh, and we should look to that because all of the uh, all of our competitors and rivals on the world stage, you know, they they have their young being educated very hard, indeed working many times as hard as some kids do here to get the lifestyle that we're used to and thinks our God-given right, and it isn't. It's only our God-given right if we fight for it. Absolutely, but we have seen uh, in other parts of the world, Europe, the, the rise of the right or the far right, mm -hmm. if you believe the media. We've seen that from Italy to the Netherlands, South America, Central America, El Salvador and Argentina. What do you think is behind that? Is just that politics going backwards and forwards, or is, is that a a movement that you, mm. that you think there's, there's something behind that? I'm always wary about drawing out too big a, an extrapolation of the sort of left-right global shifts, because, for instance, I mean, we've got elections this year, I'm sure you've noticed, in America <laughs> and, yes. in, and in Britain. You've heard tell of that. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and also in Britain. And in Britain, uh, it shows very likely that we'll have a left-wing Labour government uh, uh, in Britain oh, by yes. the end of this year. And, Arguably, you know, you've had one for some years. Well, I think yes. we've had one for 14 years. <laughs> but, yeah, that's... A, um, but, you know, uh, the, uh, so the interesting thing is that Britain might be heading to the left, uh, which I think it will be a disaster for Britain on the economy and much else, mm. but the Conservatives d deserve a drubbing. Um, and in America, you know, who knows? Maybe it's Joe Biden, maybe it's Donald Trump. Um, if it's Joe Biden again, then yes. I mean, a lot of countries have been shifting to the right and, and quite quite a long way to the right in some cases. Mm. Uh, um, but if, 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 you know, countries like Britain and America shift to the left, you can't say that it's a pattern that is everywhere. Absolutely. I would like to think that, 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 that it's possible for voters, though, to show how they actually feel. There's a, there's a strong feeling in a lot of countries of just disengagement. You know, voters saying, I, I don't have anyone to vote for. It's all a waste of time. I'd like to think that, what you know, whenever people say this party is beyond the pale, that party is beyond the pale, I say, look, the democratic process includes people you don't like. Mm. But the most important thing is do people feel they have a stake in it? And that includes the stake, as I say, to kick hard at the people who've been telling you what you should do, what you should think and who you should be. Absolutely. Now, there has been this political realignment we've seen in the UK, mm. US, in, uh, in Australia as well, where you've got the affluent leaning increasingly left, whilst the mm. working class, middle class are switching to, to the conservative side. Mm. Um, it's, it explains a lot of the support that Trump receives. Yeah. Uh, why do you think that is? Why do you think there's been almost this... Uh, uh, Quite stark political realignment. Yeah, this is this is what I, I think it's partly attributable to what Rob Henderson, the American writer, calls the luxury beliefs class. Luxury you know, the, the the people you're talking about, the sort of you know the elites in a lot of the media. I mean, there's lots of elites always, and and, and there's no bad thing. But I mean, the the, the, the specific thing of having an elite of anti-elitists, having an elite that. That, that, that believes that they, they know best and the public are the problem, mm. you know, to use the old uh, joke of Brecht, you know, the public are the problem, we need to find a new public. <laughs> um, the, but the people, the people, you know, like the ones we were talking about earlier, and the corporations and the, the big media and, 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 you know, entertainment stars who, who came, came out uh, for, the, for the losing side on the referendum, a lot of those people are just signalling something. They're just saying, I'm on the right side. Mm. Um, and, of course, I think what a lot of people in the electorate have caught, cottoned on to is that a lot of these people who lecture us and berate us from the stage of the Oscars to Parliament here, a lot of them are saying things that they think make them look good yeah. but are actually bad for the country. Like, you know, my friend Lionel Shriver pointed this out some time ago about the thing of, you know, self-hating. And she said to me, Douglas, these people you're talking about who are pushing self-hatred on us, 
they don't hate themselves at all. <laughs> they love themselves. They love themselves. And making other people feel self-hatred and pretending they do, pretending they're so guilt-ridden, millions of ribbons down each <laughs> side of their jackets. Those people feel fantastic about themselves. Yeah. And making us feel guilty is just part of that. It's part of the act. Now, to current events, we saw that horrific Islamist attack in Russia, mm. saw 137 people gunned down, including three children. Another 182 people were injured. Uh, the death toll there was horrific. Since then, we've seen the capture of the four suspects and the torture they've been subjected to by Russian forces, with uh, one having an ear cut off and it fed to him, another having um, electric... Uh, shocks given to his genital area. I mean, the brutality is, mm. is, is, is horrific as well. And Douglas, I know this is going to be a unpopular opinion, but perhaps I wouldn't be saying this if it was my family member who'd been murdered, but this disturbs me greatly and the reaction to it disturbs me greatly. There, there seems to be really not much condemnation of this torture. Is torture ever justified? No, I, d I don't think it is. Uh, but I, I think that what you see is just the operation tendencies of the FSB. Mm. This is how the Russians operate. But uh, again, it's one of the things that people should remember when they're forever castigating the West. You know, everyone's always, you know, all these people who, who go around saying, you know, war crimes about the Israelis, genocide, uh, war crimes in America, torture, and all this sort of thing. This is a country, Russia, which actually does do that and actually does believe in it. And, and proudly, on and proudly, camera. Exactly. There's, there's video footage of all this. Exactly. Sort. And they're not going to bow to... I mean, you know, maybe a, a mob can get together a protest group later uh, in Melbourne about this. But I doubt it <laughs> will, you know, well, because the Russians don't listen. They don't listen at all. what about the reaction? Because from otherwise decent people, they seem to have no issue with this. And I know we're talking about monsters. I know we're talking about men mm. who gunned down over 100 people, including three children, but uh, the justification for torture, yeah. that worries me. That sure. worries me about where we are. Well, I think, look, I think, that, I think that, look, I mean, these terrorists uh, are obviously, you know, the lowest of the low life. So, the, mm. I mean, to do that, to go into a shopping centre and a theatre and start gunning people down, we've seen it elsewhere. We've seen it in London. We've seen it in Paris, you know. Uh, we've seen it, sadly, around the world. Um, and it's it's inevitable that there is rage in people's hearts about this, and there's even more rage in the West because our governments tell us we shouldn't be allowed to feel rage. No. We uh, can't even condemn it. We had the Manchester bombing, yeah. and, and there was almost an immediate uh, drive against yeah. Islamophobia. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's always the same, always yeah. the same. But, but, you know, the thing is, there, there, there is... When somebody does something, when a group of people do something like ISIS uh, appeared to have done in Moscow, uh, of course, there's a sort of feeling of vengefulness and revenge. Now, in the West, uh, we would hope that we would prosecute that uh, that revenge as carefully as possible, and that it would be legal, that it would go through the law courts if the people are captured alive. Um, but in other theatres, they'd be killed in operation and and and, and during the attack and else, uh, you know, other things. Um, it's just that, you know, th that is a, a, an inevitable tendency to want to have revenge after that. Uh, but, I mean, the fact that in Russia that revenge extends to torture, they say, is not at all, not at all a surprise in Russia. But, but uh, you know, I mean, I, th I think you can, you can want there to be no pity for the terrorists no. without encouraging them to be mutilated by the Russian troops. I mean, it's just... Now, before you go, I've got to ask you about the US. Uh, we're seeing the political persecution, prosecution of Donald Trump. Uh, they've been trying to take his assets. Uh, mm. Today there's been a development there with the, with the bond being reduced dramatically and he's saying that he'll be mm. posting that new amount. I think it's 175 million US. How do you see this uh, effort to get Trump before mm. he can be re-elected? It, it seems uh. to be a determined effort from, from the Democrats and their lawmakers mm. to politicise the justice system. And it really has a dangerous effect. You look at some of the polling now, trust in the US justice system is at record lows. People yeah. do not trust the system. Well, it's a very interesting thing, that because, of course, a, um, a lot of Americans didn't trust the justice system already. 
Um, I mean, the conviction rates in the U.S. courts, for anyone who's been through them, are astronomically high. Almost Beijing-like, but not quite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's teetering on, on uh, 99%, you know. And, uh, and so a lot of Americans who've had experience of that um, already distrusted it. Then you've had the sort of super politicization of things like the Supreme Court. Um, and 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 then then the Trump uh, uh, um, uh, persecution. And I do think it's a kind of persecution. I have plenty of criticisms of Donald Trump. But if you wanted to um, make sure he wasn't elected again, then run a really good candidate against him <laughs> and highlight the things that he did in his term of office that you disagree with. Mm. Most people, I think, in America can see that this is a form of endless persecution against Trump. It certainly looks like that. These, and this way of sort of trying to ruin him financially just looks like the final sort of, you know, the final turn of that dial. And I think a lot of people will see it as being cruel and unusual. I think it's only helping Trump, though, oh. you know? I mean, as you say, I, I'm not sure that outside America people are quite prepared for this. You know, the polls that you've seen and I've seen that say that he's likely to win against Biden later mm. this year. I mean, personally, you know, I have um, I have just about enough existential energy to, uh, you know, cover various wars and things. I'm not sure if I have the existential energy this time, Rita, to cover Trump-Biden part two. I, we last met in New America, yes. in New York, in Trump-Biden uh, round one. I don't know. I mean, those those guys might be there for round two. You might be there for round two. I, I think I might be just propping up the bar, exhausted. But I, I'm not sure. It, this is going to be brutal, Rita. Oh, it is absolutely going to be brutal. But we've seen the Biden administration reverse course on Israel. And, and mm. a lot of the conjecture there is, well, it's because they're trying to hold on to those swing seats, Michigan, mm. Minnesota, where there's large Muslim populations who are very upset with the Democrats for mm. standing with Israel. How do you see that? How is the Biden administration going to balance that, the, that supporting their ally, but also making sure they don't lose those, those uh, well, there's crucial a, swing seats? There's a very interesting thing that's gone on uh, in the last few days which people haven't noted, which is whilst the rhetoric has ramped up against Israel from the Biden administration, there's been a new uh, package of arms for Israel from the administration. Now, that's very interesting. I'm very pleased that that's the case because I think Israel should, should be allowed to win its war against Hamas and destroy Hamas. Um, but it's very interesting that they're doing this two-hander, two effectively. Mm -hmm. The sort of public statements and then what they're actually doing. Uh, I mean, you know, David Cameron, Lord Cameron to us, uh, uh, he, he's just said that, you know, if Israel doesn't do what Lord Cameron wants, then he might stop arms shipments to Israel from Britain. Britain doesn't make a significant number of our amount of arms anyway. So, I mean, it's, it's a sort of rather grandstanding thing to do. But it is interesting, that difference between the rhetoric and the reality uh, uh, from Biden. Um, I would just say, you know, um, uh, the Biden administration has been a pretty good friend to Israel during this, but uh, they, they, do, they are worried, it seems, about their polling in Minnesota and so on. I, you know, I understand it. I would just say that, you know, I mean, Rita, if, if, if Australia was at war and, uh, or, or no, let's put it the other way around. Let's say if America was at war and it wasn't going down all that well among some people in Australia, I would not expect the Australian prime minister to pick up the phone to the president and say, now, look, you've got to, you've got to halt your war <laughs> because some of our voters in Melbourne are displeased with it. Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't expect that from an ally. No. I mean, the job of an ally is to be supportive to you in your hour of need. And God knows it's an hour of need in Israel. Uh, and I would hope that America would stand by Israel as it finishes its war against the terrorists, as I would expect people to stand by this country if this country suffered a, a similar outrage to that which uh, Israel suffered on the 7th. Douglas Murray, always a pleasure. Thank you for your time this evening. Terrific to see you in person.